Discord to the cloud. There we go. Uh, I did to my computer, and there, uh, I doubt it would contain all of uh, our, our wonderful brilliance. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Now and in the future, we're Mystery and Theater Collective. This is our Zoom reading series where we choose plays to read, uh, and we are supported by just wonderfully terrific people uh, who are reading roles along uh, with us, or I should say, uh, reading roles, and we are just with them um, because, you know, uh, you all are better than we are. Um, the show that we are reading today uh, is, uh, hold on, let me pull this up, uh, the Mambo number 7,507, uh, better known as The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, uh, <laughs> which is a play by Simon Stevens, uh, adapted from the novel of the same name by Mark Haddon, uh, and it um, premiered in 2012. Um, so it's the second most recent play that we've read, I believe. Great. Um, I don't, I think Clean House was a little earlier 2000s, uh, but I know that the flick was a little after that. Um, but yeah, uh, we're reading this show. Um, we will go through name ourselves and who we're reading as. Uh, if you want to name all of these characters that you read as, if you're a voice, please feel free. Um, but you can also just say voice five or whatever. Um, it's up to you. Uh, no pressure at all. Uh, I am Doran. I will be reading. Uh, I'm a member of the collective and I'll be reading for uh, stage directions, which is not a character. I'll just be reading the stage directions and then also reading <laughs> for uh, voice six, uh, which is Mrs. Alexander and Posh Woman. I'm Val. I'm going to be reading for Mrs. Judy Boone, and I'm not a member of the collector. I'm just collective. Pardon me. I'm just a hanger on. <laughs> Excellent. I'm Andy. I'm a member of the collective. I'm reading for voice one, which is Mrs. Shears, Mrs. Gascoigne, woman on train and shopkeeper. I am Thomas. I'm going to be reading voice three. I am a member of the collective. I'm Amy and I'll be reading for Christopher. I'm Dave, I'll be reading for Ed and I don't know what a collective is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Stephanie Ann and uh, it's my first time here. Thank you all for having me. I'll be reading voice two, which apparently is Roger Shears, Mr. Wise, duty sergeant, man behind counter and drunk number one. I'm Alyssa. I'm not a member of the collective. Um, I am reading for Reverend Peters, Uncle Terry, Voice 4, the station policeman, and the station guard. I'm Natalie, and I am reading for just Siobhan. <laughs> I'm Erin, and I'll be reading for voice number five, also reading number 40, Lady in the Street, Information, and Punk Girl. Um, cool. I think that's everybody, right? I'm getting no objections, so I will say yes. We're, <laughs> we are good to forge ahead. Um, so on my watch, we will begin this race, and whoever wins... Uh, whoever finishes first wins uh, a, a golden fork. Um, I think some important things to note uh, is that all actors remain on stage unless prescribed. Otherwise, obviously, we're not on stage, but just to sort of set the setting for anybody who's just putting this on and listening to it uh, or, you know, putting it on and kind of watching, but also closing their eyes and imagining things. Um, um, there is also a dead dog with a fork sticking out of it um, and the scenes, although I will be uh, stating the number scene and sort of the setting where that scene is taking place, scenes do run into one another uh, without interruption regardless of alterations in space or time or chronology. Um, so we'll be sort of fudging that a little bit, but as far as your mental stage picture, I think that's important. Um, so we begin. Uh, part one, one garden. 
A dead dog lies in the middle of the stage. A large garden fork is sticking out of its side. Christopher Boone, 15 years old, stands on one side of it. His 42-year-old neighbor, Mrs. Shears, stands on the other. They stand for a while without saying anything. The rest of the company watch, waiting to see who is, who is going to dare to speak first. Holy fuck. Christopher is frozen on the, to the spot. Oh, no. Oh, Christ. Christopher's teacher, 27-year-old Siobhan, opens Christopher's book. She reads from it. it. It was seven minutes after midnight. The dog was lying on the grass in the middle of the lawn in front of Mrs. Shear's house. Its eyes were closed. It looked as if it was running on its side, the way dogs run when they think they are chasing a cat in a dream. But the dog was not running or asleep. The dog was dead. What have you done? There was a garden fork sticking out of the dog. The dog was called Wellington. It belonged to Mrs. Shears, who was our friend. She lived on the opposite side of the road, two houses down. Get away from my dog. Christopher takes two steps away from the dog. My name is Christopher John Francis Boone. I live at 36 Randolph Street, Swindon, Wiltshire. I know all of the countries in the world and the capital cities and every prime number up to 7,507. Get away from my dog, for Christ's sake! Christopher puts his hands over his ears. He closes his eyes. He rolls forward. He presses his forehead onto the grass. He starts groaning. After 12 and a half minutes, a policeman arrived. He had a big orange leaf stuck to the bottom of his shoe, which was poking out from one side. This is good, Christopher. It's quite exciting. I like the details. They make it more realistic. A policeman enters. He has a big orange leaf stuck to the bottom of his shoe, which is poking out to one side. He squats next to Christopher. He squatted down next to me and he said to me... Christopher stops groaning. That is I. Would you like to tell me what's going on here, young man? Christopher lifts his head from the ground. There's some time. Christopher looks at the policeman. There's some time. I do not tell lies. Mother used to say that this was because I was a good person, but it is not because I am a good person. It is because I can't tell lies. The dog is dead. <laughs> I got that far. I think someone killed the dog. How old are you? I'm 15 years and three months and two days. And what precisely are you doing in the garden? I'm talking to you. Okay. Uh, why were you in the garden in the first place? I was holding the dog. Why were you holding the dog? I like dogs. Did you kill the dog? I did not kill the dog. You seem very upset about this. I'm going to ask you once again. Christopher starts groaning. It's horrific. Christopher carries on groaning. Young man, I'm going to ask you to stop making that noise and to stand up, please, please calm, calmly and quietly. Christopher carries on groaning. Marvelous, just flipping. The policeman tries to lift him up by his arm. Christopher screams. He hits the policeman. The policeman stares at Christopher. For a while, the two look at one another, neither entirely sure what to say or quite believing what has just happened. I'm arresting you for assaulting a police officer. I strongly advise you to get back in, to get into the back of the police car, because if you try any of that monkey business again, you little shit. I'm going to seriously lose my rag, is that understood? To school. I find people confusing. This is for two main reasons. The first main reason is that people do a lot of talking without using any words. Siobhan says that if you raise one eyebrow, it can mean lots of different things. It can mean, I want to do sex with you. I never said that. Yes, you did. I never used those words, Christopher. You did on September 12th last year at first break. And it can also mean I think what you just said was very stupid. Three police station. Do you please, could you take your laces out of your shoes, please, Christopher? He does. Thank you. Could you empty your pocket onto the desk, please? That's in case I have anything in them that I, sh I could use to kill myself or escape or attack a policeman with. The duty sergeant looks at him for a beat. That's right. I've got a Swiss army knife, but I only use that for doing odd jobs, like not for stabbing or things or hurting people. Jolly good. Christopher empties his pockets. 
piece of string. Piece of a wooden puzzle. And three pellets of rat food for Toby, my pet rat. One pound 47. Made up of a one pound coin, a 20p coin, two 10p coins, a 5p coin, and a 2p coin. A red paper clip. A key for the front door. A sasami knife with 13 attachments, including a wire stripper and a saw and a toothpick with tweezers. Could you take your watch off, please, Christopher? No. I'm sorry, Christopher? I need my watch to know exactly what time it is. Do you have any family, Christopher? Yes, I do. And who is your family? Mother and father, but m mother is dead. And also Uncle Terry, who lives in Sunderland. He is my father's brother. But, and my grandparents too, but three of them are dead. And Grandma Burton lives in a home where she, where, because she has senile dementia and thinks I'm someone on television. Right. Lovely. Do you know your father's phone number, Christopher? For police station. Chris returns to Ed. Ed looks at him. He holds his hand out in front of him with his fingers stretched. Christopher does the same. They touch fingers, then let go. I could see the Milky Way as they drove me towards the town center. Could you? Some people think the Milky Way is a long line of stars, but it isn't. Our galaxy is a huge disk of stars with millions of light years across. Is that right? Christopher, Mr. Boone, could you come this way, please? Are you going to interview me and record the interview? I don't think there will be any need for that. I've spoken to your father and he says you didn't mean to hit the policeman. Did you mean to hit the policeman? Yes. But you didn't mean to hurt the policeman. No, I didn't mean to hurt the policeman. I just wanted him to stop touching me. You do know that it's wrong to hit a policeman, don't you? I do. Did you kill the dog, Christopher? I did not kill the dog. Do you know that it is wrong to lie to a policeman? You can get into a very great deal of trouble if you do. Yes. Do you know who killed the dog? No. Are you telling the truth? Yes, I always tell the truth. Right. I'm going to give you a caution. Is that going to be on a piece of paper, like a certificate I can keep? No. A caution means that we are going to keep a record of what you did, that you hit a policeman and that it was an accident and you didn't mean to hurt the policeman. But it wasn't an accident. Christopher, please. If you get into any more trouble, we will take this record out and see that you have been given a caution and we will take things much more seriously. Do you understand what I am saying? Yes. Five, school. The second main reason I find people confusing is that people often talk using metaphors. These are examples of metaphors. I am seriously, I'm going to seriously lose my rag. He was the apple of her eye. They had a skeleton in the cupboard. The dog was stone dead. The word metaphor means carrying something from one place to another, and is when you describe something by using a word for something that it isn't. This means that the word metaphor is a metaphor. Wow, that's clever. It's true. Yes. I think it should be called a lie because a pig is not like a day and people do not have skeletons in the cupboards. And when I try and make a picture of the phrase in my head, it just confuses me because imagining an apple in someone's eye doesn't have, to, doesn't have anything to do with liking someone a lot. And it makes you forget what the person was talking about. Six home. Krista returns to Ed. I'm sorry. It's okay. I didn't kill Wellington. I know. Christopher, you have to stay out of trouble, okay? I didn't know I was going to get into trouble. I like Wellington and I went to say hello to him and I didn't know that someone had killed him. Just try and keep your nose out of other people's business. I'm going to try to figure out how to find out who killed Wellington. Were you listening to what I was saying, Christopher? Yes, I was listening to what you were saying, but when someone gets murdered, you have to find out who did it so that they can be punished. It's a bloody dog, Christopher. A bloody dog. I think dogs are important too. I think some dogs are cleverer than some people. Steve, for example, comes to school on Thursdays needing help eating his food and he probably couldn't even fetch a stick. Leave it. I wonder if the police will find out who killed him and punish that person. I said leave it for God's sake.
Are you sad about Wellington? Yes, Christopher, you could say that. You could very well say that. Siobhan reads more from the book. Seven, home. Mother died two years ago. I came home from school one day and no one answered the door. So I went and found the secret key that we keep under the flower pot outside the kitchen window. I let myself into the house and wiped my feet in the mat. I put the key in the bowl on the table. I took off my coat and hung by the side of the fridge so it would be ready for school the next day and gave three pellets of rat food to Toby, who is my pet rat. I made myself a raspberry milkshake and heated it up in the microwave. And then I went up to my bedroom and turned on my bedroom light and played six games of Tetris and got to level 38, which is my fourth best ever score. An hour later, father came home from work. Christopher, have you seen your mum? No. He went downstairs and started making some phone calls. I did not hear what he said. Then he came up to my room and said he had to go out for a while and he wasn't sure how long he'd be but he said if I needed anything, I should call him on his mobile phone. He was away for two and a half hours. When he came back, I went downstairs. I'm afraid you won't be seeing your mother for a while. Why not? Your mother has had to go into hospital. Can we visit her? No. Why can't we? She needs rest. She needs to be on her own. It is, is it a psychiatric hospital? No, it's an ordinary hospital. She has a problem, a problem with her heart. I'll make her get well card. If I make her get well card, will you take it in for her tomorrow? Eight, school. How are you today, Christopher? I'm very well, thank you. That's good. In the bus on the way to school, we passed four red cars in a row. Four. So today is a good day. Great, I'm glad. I've decided I'm going to try to figure out who killed Wellington because a good day is a day for projects and planning things. Who's Wellington? Wellington is a dog that used to belong to my neighbor, Mr. Shears, who is our friend, but he is dead now because somebody killed him by putting a gun fork through him. And I found him and then a policeman thought that I had killed him, but I hadn't. And then he tried to touch me, so I hit him and then I had to go to the police station. Gosh. And I'm going to find out who really killed Wellington and make it a project even though father told me not to. Did he? Yes. I see. I don't always do what I'm told. Why? Because when people tell you what to do, it is usually confusing and doesn't make sense. For example, people, people have to say be quiet, but they don't tell you how long to be quiet for. No. Why did your father tell you not to try to find out who killed Wellington, Christopher? I don't know. Christopher, if your father's told you not to do something, maybe you shouldn't do it. Mm. Well, we're meant to be writing stories today, so why don't you write about what happened to Wellington? Okay, I will. Nine, home. Christopher, I'm sorry. Your mother's died. She's had a heart attack. It wasn't expected. What kind of heart attack? I don't know what kind of heart attack. Now isn't the moment, Christopher, to be asking questions like that. It was probably an aneurysm. I'm sorry, Christopher. I'm really sorry. 10 Street. Mrs. Shear's house is assembled. That evening, I went round to Mrs. Shear's house and knocked on the door and waited for her to answer it. Mrs. Shear's answers her door. She is drinking a cup of tea. What are you doing here? I wanted to come and tell you that I didn't kill Wellington. And I also want to find out who killed him. Christopher, I really don't think I want to see you right now. Do you know who killed Wellington? If you don't go now, I will call the police again. Eleven, school. Reverend Peters, where is heaven? Sorry, Christopher? In our universe, whereabouts is it exactly? Uh, It's not in our universe. It's another kind of place altogether. There isn't an, anything outside our universe, Reverend Peters. There isn't another kind of place altogether. Except maybe if you go through a black hole. But a black hole is what's called a singularity, which means it's impossible to find out what's on the other side because the gravity of the black hole is so big that even electromagnetic waves, can, like lights, can't get out of it. And electromagnetic waves are how we get information about things which are far away. And if heaven is on the other side of a black hole, then dead people would have to be fired into space on a rocket and to get there, and they aren't, or people would notice. Reverend Peters looks at him for a while before he responds. Well, 
when I say heaven is outside our universe, it's really just a manner of speaking. I suppose what it really means is that they are with God. But where is God? Christopher, we should talk about this on another day when I have more time. 12th Street. The next day was Saturday. And there's not much to do on a Saturday unless Father takes me out somewhere on an outing to the boating lake or to the garden centre. But on this Saturday, England were playing Romania football, which meant that we weren't going to do any going to go on any outing because Father wanted to watch the match on television. So I made a decision. I decided to do some more detection. I decided to go out on my own. Can I help you? Do you know who killed Wellington? Who are you? I'm Christopher Boone from number 36, and I know you. You're Mr. Thompson. I'm Mr. Thompson's brother. Do you know who killed Wellington? Who the fuck is Wellington? Mrs. Shear's dog. Mrs. Shear's from number 39. Someone killed her dog? With a fork. Jesus Christ. A garden fork. Oh. Do you know who killed him? I haven't a bloody clue. Did you see anything suspicious on Thursday evening? Look, son, do you really think you should be going around asking questions like this? Yes, I do, because I want to find out who killed Wellington and I'm writing a book about it. Well, I was in Gloucester on Thursday, so you're asking the wrong bloke. Thank you. It isn't Christopher, isn't it? Yes, it is. Do you know who killed Wellington? No. No, I don't. No. I'm sorry. Did you see anything suspicious on Thursday evening, that, which might be a clue? Like what? Like strangers or some, the sound of people arguing. I didn't, Christopher. No. Do you know of anyone who might want to make Mrs. Shears sad? Perhaps you should be talking to your father about this. I can't talk to my father about, about it because he told me to stay out of other people's business. Well, maybe he has a point, Christopher. So you don't know anything about that might be a clue? No. You be careful, young man. I will be. Thank you for helping me with my questions. Do you know who killed Wellington on Thursday night? Bloody hell, policemen really are getting younger these, these days, aren't they? <laughs> Mr. Wise laughs. Christopher walks away. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, 37, 41, 43, 47, 53, 59, 61, 67, 61, 71, 73, 79, 83, 89, 97. Do you know anything about Wellington getting killed? I'm afraid you're going to have to say that again. I'm a little deaf. Do you know anything about Wellington getting killed? I heard about it yesterday. Dreadful. Dreadful. Do you know who killed him? No, I don't. Somebody must know, because the person who killed Wellington very knows that they killed Wellington, unless they were a loony and didn't know what they were doing, or unless they had amnesia. Well, I suppose you're probably right. Thank you for helping me with my investigation. You're Christopher, aren't you? Yes, I live in number 36. We haven't talked before, have we? No, I don't talk to strangers, but I'm doing detective work. I see you every day. Going to school on your school bus. <laughs> Fuck, what's happening to my voice? It's very nice of you to come and say hello, even if it's only because you're doing detective work. Thank you. I have a grandson your age. My age is 15 years and three months and three days. Well, almost your age. You don't have a dog, do you? No. You'd probably like a dog, wouldn't you? I have a rat. A rat? He's called Toby. Oh. Most people don't like rats because they think they carry diseases like bubonic plague. But that's only because they lived in sewers and stowed away on ships coming from foreign countries where there were strange diseases. But rats are very clean. Do you want to come in for tea? I don't go into other people's houses. Well, maybe I could bring some tea out here. Do you like lemonade? I only like orangeade. Well, luckily I have some of that as well. 
And what about Battenberg? I don't know because I don't know what Battenberg is. It's a kind of cake. It has marzipan icing around the edge. It's. Is it a long cake with a square cross section that can be divided equally into, into equally sized alternating colored squares? Yes, I, I think you could probably describe it like that. I think I like the pink squares, but not the yellow squares because I don't like yellow. And I don't know what marzipan is, but I don't know whether, so I don't know whether I'd like that. I'm afraid marzipan is yellow too. Perhaps I should bring out some biscuits instead. Do you like biscuits? Yes, some sort of biscuits. I'll get a selection. She goes into her house. He waits. Then before she gets back, 13, school. She moved very slowly because she was an old lady. And she was inside the house for more than six minutes. And I began to get nervous because I didn't know her whether, well enough to know whether she was telling the truth about getting orange aid and Banberg cake. And I thought she might be ringing the police and then I'd get into much more serious trouble because of the caution. So I walked away. The company cheer as if a goal has been scored. Mm, yes. Oh, hey. Why would you kill a dog? I wouldn't. I think you would only kill a dog if A, you hated the dog, or B, you were a lunatic, or C, because you wanted to make Mr. Shears sad. I don't know anyone who hated Wellington, so if it was A, it was probably a stranger. And I don't know any lunatics either, so if it was B, it was probably a stranger. Right. But most murders are committed by someone who is known to the victim. In fact, you are more likely to be murdered by a member of your own family on Christmas Day. Is that a fact? Yes, actually, it is a fact. Wellington was therefore most likely to have been killed by someone known to him. I only know one person who didn't like Mrs. Shears, and that was Mr. Shears, who divorced Mrs. Shears and left, him to left her to live somewhere else, and who knew Wellington very well. That means Mr. Shears is my prime suspect. Christopher, uh, I'm going to find out more about Mr. Shears. 14, school office. Mr. Boone, nobody has ever taken an A-level examination in the school before. He can be the first, then. I don't know if we have the facilities in the school to allow him to do that. Then get the facilities. I can't treat Christopher any differently to any other student. Why not? Because then, then everybody would want to be treated differently. So? It would set a precedent. Christopher can always do his A-levels later, when he's 18. Now, Christopher is getting a crap enough deal already, don't you think? Without you shitting on him from a great height as well. Jesus, this is the one thing he's really good at. We should talk about this later. Maybe on our own. Are there things which you're too embarrassed to say to me in front of Christopher? No, it's not that. Say them now, then. If Christopher takes an A-level, then he would have to have an invigilator, a member of the staff looking after him in his, on his own in a separate room. I'll, I'll pay for it. They can do it after school. Here. 50 quid. Is that enough? Mr. Boone. I'm not going to take no for an answer. Ed turns to Christopher. 15, home. Where have you been? I've been out. I've just had a phone call from Mrs. Shears. What the hell were you doing poking around her garden? I was doing detective work, trying to figure out who killed Wellington. How many times do I have to tell you, Christopher, I told you to keep your nose out of other people's business? I think Mr. Shears probably killed Wellington. I will not have that man's name mentioned in my house. Everybody on stage pauses to look at Ed and Christopher. Why not? That man is evil. Does that mean he might have killed Wellington? Jesus wept. Okay, Christopher, I'm going to say this for the last and final time. I will not tell you again. Look at me when I'm talking to you, for God's sake. Look at me! You are not to go asking Mr. Shears who killed that bloody dog. You are not to go asking anyone who killed that bloody dog. You are not to go trespassing on other people's gardens. You are to stop this ridiculous bloody detective game right now. I'm going to make you promise me, Christopher, and you know what it means when I make you promise. 16, home. You're on mute. I think I would make a very good astronaut. Yes, mate, you probably would. To be a good astronaut, you have to be intelligent, and I'm intelligent. You also have to understand how machines work, and I'm good at understanding how machines work. 
you also have to be someone who would like being on their own in a tiny spacecraft thousands and thousands of miles away from the surface of the earth and not panic or get claustrophobia or homesick or insane. And I really like little spaces so long as there is no one else in them with me. I noticed. Sometimes when I want to be on my own, I get into the laundry room and slide in beside the boiler and pull the door closed behind me and sit there and think for hours. And it makes me feel very calm. So I would have to be an astronaut on my own or have my own part of the spacecraft that no one else could come into. And there would also be no yellow things or brown things on the spacecraft, so that would be okay too. And I would have to talk to other people from mission control, but we would do that through a radio link up and a TV monitor, so it wouldn't be like real people who are strangers, but it would be like playing a computer game. Which you like. I also wouldn't be homesick at all because I'd be surrounded by lots of things I like, which are machines and computers and outer space. And I would be able to look out of the little window of the spacecraft and know that there's no one else near me for thousands and thousands. Christopher. What? Could you please just give it a bit of a break, mate? Please. And know that there was no one else near me for thousands and thousands of miles, which is what I sometimes pretend at night in the summer when I go and lie on the lawn and look up at the sky and I put my hands round the sides of my face so that I can't see the fence and the chimney and the clothesline and I can pretend I'm in space. And all I could see would be stars. And stars are the places where molecules that life is made of were constructed billions of years ago. For example, all of the iron in your blood, which stops you from being anemic, was made in a star. I would like it if I could take Toby with me into space. And it might be allowed because they sometimes do take animals into space for experiments. And if I could think of a good experiment you could do with a rat that didn't hurt the rat, I could make them let me take Toby. But if they didn't let me, I would still go because it would be a dream come true. 17 school. Father said. I see. That's a pity. So the book is finished. Well, Christopher, if your father said he wanted you to stop, then I think he probably had a good reason. And I think you should stop. But you can still be very proud because what you've written so far is just, well, it's great. It's not a proper book. Why not? It doesn't have a proper ending. I never figured out who killed Wellington. So the murderer is still at large. Not all murders are solved, Christopher. And not all murderers are caught. Father said I was never to mention Mr. Shears' name in the house again or again, and that he was an evil man, and maybe that meant he was the person who killed Wellington. Christopher, I think you should do what your father tells you to do. 18 the street. What happened to you the other day? I came out again and you'd gone. I had to eat all the little biscuits myself. I was looking forward to our little chat. I don't do chatting. No, I don't suppose you do. Do you like computers? Yes, I like computers. I have a computer in my room. I know. I can see you sitting at your computer in your bedroom sometimes when I look across the street. And I like maths and looking after Toby. And I also like outer space and I like being on my own. I bet you're very good at maths, aren't you? I am. I'm going to do A-levels maths next month and I'm going to get an A-star. Really? A-level maths? Yes, I don't tell lies. I apologize. I didn't mean to suggest that you were lying. I just, I wondered if I heard you correctly. I'm a little deaf sometimes. I'm the first person to take an A-level from my school because it's a special school. All of the other, ch all the other children at my school are stupid, except I'm not meant to call them that, even though that is what they are. Well, I am very impressed, and I hope you do get an A-star. I will. And the other thing I know about you is your favorite color is not yellow. No, it's not brown either. My favorite color is red and metal color. Do you know Mr. Shears? Not really, no. I mean, I knew him well enough to say hello, but I didn't know much about him. I think he worked in the National Westminster Bank in town. Father said he is an evil man. Do you know why he said that? Perhaps it would not be best to talk about these things, Christopher. Why not? Because maybe your father is right, and you shouldn't go around asking questions about this. Why? 
because obviously he's going to find it quite upsetting. Why is he going to find it quite upsetting? I think you know why your father doesn't like Mrs. Shears very much. Did Mr. Shears kill mother? Kill her? Yes. Did he kill mother? No. No, of course he didn't kill your mother. But did he give her a stress that, so that she died of a heart attack? I honestly don't know what you're talking about. Well, did he hurt her so that she had to go to hospital? It's, did she have to go into hospital? Yes. And it wasn't very serious at first, but then she had a heart attack when she was at the hospital. Oh my goodness. And she died. Oh my goodness. Oh, Christopher, I'm so, so sorry. I never realized. Why did you say I don't think, I think you know why your father doesn't like Mr. Shears very much? Oh dear, dear, dear. Uh, Christopher, look, perhaps we should take a little walk in the park together. This is not the place to be talking about this kind of thing. 19 Park. I'm going to say something to you, and you must promise not to tell your father that I told you this. Why? Christopher, please, just trust me. I promise. Your mother, before she died, was very good friends with Mr. Shears. I know. No. Christopher, I'm, I'm not sure that you do. I, I mean, they were very good friends. Very, very good friends. Do you mean they were doing sex? Yes, Christopher, that is what I mean. I'm sorry, Christopher, I, I really didn't mean to say anything that was going to upset you. Was that my Mr. Shears left Mrs. Shears because he was doing sex with someone that when he was still married to Mrs. Shears? Yes, I expect so. I think I should go now. Are you okay, Christopher? I can't be with you on my own because you are a stranger. I'm not a stranger, Christopher. I'm a friend. 21, school. Ed finds Christopher's book on the kitchen table. Have you told your father about this? No. Are you, going to, are you going to tell your father about this? No. Ed goes to the book. There is a tone. He begins reading Christopher's book. Did it make you sad to find all this out? Find out what? Did it make you sad to find out that your mother and Mr. Shears had an affair? No. Are you telling the truth, Christopher? Yes, I always tell the truth. It didn't make me sad because mother is dead. And I would be feeling sad about something that isn't real and doesn't exist and that would be stupid. What was your mother like? Do you remember much about her? I remember the 20th of July, 2008. I was nine years old. It was a Saturday. We were on holiday in Cornwall. We were at the beach at a place called Palero. Mother was wearing a pair of shorts made out of denim and a stripy blue swimming costume. And she was smoking cigarettes called cold slit, which were mint flavored. She, she wasn't swimming. She was sunbathing on a towel, which had red and purple stripes. And she was reading a book by Georgette Heyer called The Masqueraders. And when she finished sun sunbathing, she went into the water and she said, Bloody Nora, it's cold. Bloody Nora, it's cold. Um, and, the, and she said I should come to, and swim too, but I didn't like swimming because I, didn't like take, I don't like taking my clothes off. And she said I should just roll up my trousers and ro walk into the water a little way. So I did. And Mother said, Christopher, look, it's lovely. And she jumped backward and disappeared into the water. And I thought that a shark had eaten her and I screamed. And then she stood up out of the water and came over to me where I was standing and held up her right hand and spread out her fingers like a fan. Come on, Christopher, touch my hand. Come on now, stop screaming. Touch my hand. Listen to me, Christopher, you can do it. It's okay, Christopher, it's, it's okay. There aren't any sharks in Cornwall. We were inside the park. Mrs. Alexander stopped walking and said, I'm going to say something to you, and you must promise not to tell your father that I told you this. Your mother, before she died, was a very good friend with Mr. Shears. And other times she used to say, If I hadn't married your father, I think I'd be living in a little farmhouse in the south of France with someone called Jean, and he'd be... Ooh, a, a local handyman, you know, doing painting and decorating for people. 
gardening, building fences, and we'd have a veranda with figs growing over it, and there would be a little field of sunflowers at the bottom of the garden, and a little town on the hill in the distance, and we'd sit outside in the evening and drink red wine, and smoke Galois cigarettes, and watch the sun go down. 23 Home. What is this? Christopher looks at Ed. It's a book I'm writing. Is this true? Did you speak to Mrs. Alexander? Yes. Jesus, Christopher, how stupid are you? What the fuck did I tell you, Christopher? Not to mention Mr. Shears' name in our house. And not to go asking Mrs. Shears or anyone about who killed that bloody dog. And not to go trespassing on other people's gardens. And to stop this ridiculous bloody detective game. Except I haven't done any of those things. I just asked Mrs. Alexander about Mr. Shears because I was doing chatting. Don't give me that, you little shit. You knew exactly what you were bloody doing. I've read the book, remember? What else did I say, Christopher? I don't know. Come on, you're the memory man. Not to go around sticking your fucking nose into other people's business. And what did you do? You go around sticking your nose into other people's business. You go around digging up the past and sharing it with every Tom, Dick and Harry you bump into. What am I going to do with you, Christopher? What the fuck am I going to do with you? Ed throws Christopher's book. I was just chatting with Mrs. Alexander. I wasn't doing investigating. I ask you to do one thing for me, Christopher. One thing. I didn't want to talk to Mrs. Alexander. It was Mrs. Alexander who... Ed grabs Christopher's arm. Christopher screams. Ed and Christopher tussle. Ed hits Christopher hard. Christopher falls unconscious for a few seconds. Ed stands above him. I need a drink. He goes and picks up the book. He leaves. He comes back without the book. I'm sorry I hit you. I didn't mean to. I love you very much, Christopher. Don't ever forget that. Where's my book? Christopher, do you understand that I love you? Ed holds his right hand up and spreads his fingers out in a fan. Christopher does the same with his left hand. They make their fingers and thumbs touch each other. It's in the dustbin in, at the front of the house. 25, map of house. Next day, when I got home from school, father was still at work. So I went outside and looked in the dustbin, but the book wasn't there. I wondered if Father had put it in his van and driven it to the tip and put it in one of the big bins there, but I did not want that to be true because then I would never see it again. One other possibility was that Father had hidden my book somewhere in the house. So I decided to do some detecting and see if I could find it. I started by looking in the kitchen. Then I detected in the laundry room then I detected in the dining room, and then I detected in the living room where I found the missing wheel of my Airfix Mr. Schmidt BF109 G6 model under the sofa. Then I went upstairs, and I didn't do any detecting in my own room because I reasoned that father wouldn't hide something from me in my own room, unless he was being very clever and doing what is called a double bluff like in a real murder mystery novel. So I decided to look in my own room only if I couldn't find the book anywhere else. I detected in the bathroom, but the only place to look was in the airing cupboard and there was nothing in there, which meant that the only room left to detect in was father's bedroom. I started by looking under the bed. There were five shoes and a comb with lots of hair in it, and a monkey wrench and a chocolate biscuit and a magazine called Men Only, and a pen, pair of underpants from Primick with a little bit of wee left in them, and a Homer Simpson tie, and a wooden spoon, but not my book. And then I looked in the drawers on either side of the dressing table, but these only contained aspirin, nail clippers, batteries, and dental floss, tissues, and a spare false tooth and a tampon, but my book wasn't there either. Then I looked in his wardrobe. In the bottom of the wardrobe was a large plastic toolbox, which was full of tools for doing, for doing it yourself. But I could see these without opening the box because it was made of transparent gray, gray plastic. Then I saw there was another box underneath the toolbox. The other box was an old cardboard box that is called the shirt box because people used to buy shirts in them. Christopher finds these things, including, finally, the shirt box. And when I opened the shirt box, I saw my book was inside it. Christopher finds his book. Then I heard his van pulling up outside the house, and I knew I had to think fast and be clever. Then I heard Father shutting the door of the van. And that's when I saw the envelope 
was an envelope addressed to me and it was lying under my book in the shirt box with some other envelopes. I picked it up. Christopher finds the envelope. It had never been opened. It said, Christopher Boone, 36 Randolph Street, Swindon, Wiltshire. Then I noticed there were lots of envelopes and they were all addressed to me. And this was interesting and confusing. Then I noticed how the words Christopher and Swindon were written. They were written like this. I only know three people who do little circles instead of dots over the letter I. One of them is Siobhan. And one of them was Mr. Loxley, who used to teach at the school. And one of them was Mother. 26, back to reality. Christopher. Hello. So, what have you been up to, young man? Today we did life skills with Siobhan, which was using money in public transport. And I had tomato soup for lunch and three apples. And I practiced some maths in the afternoon, and we went for a walk in the park with Mrs. Peters, and collected leaves for making collages. Excellent, excellent. What do you fancy for chow tonight? Baked beans and broccoli. Oh, I think that can be very easily arranged. I'm just going to put those shelves up in the living room, if that's all right with you. I'll make a bit of a racket, uh, I'm afraid. So if you want to watch television, we're going to have to ship it upstairs. I'll go and be on my own in my room. Good man. I went up to my room. And then when I was in the room, I shut the door and took out the envelope. I opened the envelope. Inside there was a letter, and this what is what was written on the letter. 451C Chapter Road, Wilsdon, London, NW2 5NG, 0208-887-8907. Dear Christopher, I was looking through some old photos last night, which made me sad. Then I found a photo of you playing with the train set we bought to you for a couple of Christmases ago. And that made me happy because it was one of the really good times we had together. Do you remember how you played with it all day and you refused to go to bed at night because you were still playing with it? We told you about train timetables and you made a train timetable time and you had a clock and you made the train run on time. And there was a little wooden station too. And we showed you how people who wanted to go on the train went to the station and bought a ticket and then got on a train. And you played with it for weeks and weeks and weeks. I liked remembering that a lot. You haven't written to me yet. So I know that you are probably still angry with me. I'm sorry, Christopher, but I still love you. I hope you don't stay angry with me forever. And I'd love it if you were able to write me a letter. I think about you all the time. Lots of love, your mum. I was really confused. Mother had never written me a letter before and mother had never lived in London. There was no date on the letter, so I couldn't work out when Mother had written the letter, and then I looked at the front of the envelope, and I saw there was a postmark, and the date on the postmark, the, the 16th of October 2013, which meant that the letter was posted 18 months after Mother had died. When I started writing my book, there was only one mystery to solve. Now there were two. I decided not to think about it anymore that night because I didn't have enough information and I could easily jump to the wrong conclusions. He lies down on the floor. He curls himself up into a ball. 27 night. Night falls, morning rises. 28 school. The next day, Christopher comes home from school. You're soaking. That's <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, give me a coat. I'll hang it up. How was school? It was good. Thank you. Joseph Fleming took his trousers off and went to the toilet all over the floor in the changing room and started to eat it. But Mr. Davis stopped him. Uh, good old Mr. Davis, eh? Joseph eats everything. Does he? 
He once ate one of those little blocks of blue disinfectant which hang on the side of the toilets. And once he ate a 50 pound note from his mother's wallet. He eats string and rubber bands and tissues and writing paper and paints and plastic forks. He also bangs his chin and screams a lot. I know how he feels. Christopher. Tyrone said that there was a horse and a pig in the poo and I said he was being stupid. But Stevan said that he wasn't. There were small plastic animals from the library that the staff used to make people tell stories. And Joseph had eaten them. Christopher, I've got to go out. Why? I've just had a call. There's a lady. Her cellar has flooded. I've got to go out and fix it. Is it an emergency? Yes, mate. It is raining very heavily. It is. The rain looks like white sparks. Christopher, if I go out, will you be okay? Yes, I will, because there's no one else around. There's no one around because everyone's staying indoors. Good, good, good. Good lad. I like looking at the rain. Terrific. I like it because it makes me think of how all the water in the world is connected. Does it? This water, this rain has evaporated actually from somewhere like maybe the Gulf of Mexico or the Baffin Bay, or, and now it's falling in front of the house. I'll have my mobile with me. Yes. So you can call me if there's a problem. Yes. <sighs> Behave yourself, Christopher, yeah? Yeah. That exits. So I went into his bedroom and opened the cupboard and lifted the toolbox off the top of the shirt box and opened the shirt box. I counted out the letters. There were 43 of them. They were all addressed to me in the same handwriting. I took one and opened it. Inside was this letter. As Judy reads, so Christopher begins to assemble his train set. His building becomes frantic, at times almost balletic. 451C Chapter Road, London, NW2 5NG 0208-887-8907. Dear Christopher, I said that I wanted to explain to you why I went away when I had the time to do it properly. Now I have lots of time. So I'm sitting on the sofa here with this letter and the radio on, and I'm going to try to explain I was not a very good mother, Christopher. Maybe if things had been different, maybe if you'd been different, I might have been better at it, but that's just the way things turned out. I'm not like your father. Your father is a much more patient person. He just gets on with things and if things upset him, he doesn't let it show. But that's not the way I am and there's nothing I can do to change it. You remember once when we were shopping in town together and we went into Bentles and it was really crowded and we had to get a Christmas present for grandma and you were frightened because of all the people in the shop and you crouched down on the floor and you put your hands over your ears and you were in the way of everyone. So I got cross because I don't like shopping at Christmas either and I told you to behave and I tried to pick you up and move you, but you shouted and you knocked those mixers off the shelf and there was a big crash. And everyone turned around to see what was going on and there were boxes and bits of string and bits of broken bowl on the floor and everyone was staring. And I saw that you had wet yourself and I was so cross. And I wanted to take you out of the shop, but you wouldn't let me touch you. And you had, you just lay on the floor and screamed and banged your hands and feet on the floor. And the, the manager came and asked me what the problem was. And I had to pay for two broken mixes. And we just had to wait until you stopped screaming. And then I had to walk you all the way home, which took hours because I knew you wouldn't go in the, on the bus again. And I remember that night I just cried and cried and cried cried and your father was really nice about it at, at first and he made you supper and put you to bed and he said these things happen and it would be okay but I said I couldn't take it anymore and eventually he got really cross and told me I was being stupid and I should pull myself together and I hit him which was wrong but I was so upset we had a lot of arguments like that because I often thought I couldn't take it anymore and 
the father is really patient, but I'm not. I get cross, even though I don't mean to. And by the end, we stopped talking to each other very much because we knew it would always end up in an argument. And I felt really lonely. And that was when I started spending time, lots of time with Roger. And that's when I started spending lots of time with Roger. And I know you might not understand any of this, but I wanted to try to explain so that you knew. We had a lot in common. And then we realized that we were in love with one another. I, I said we, I couldn't leave you and he was sad about that, but he understood that you were really important to me. And you started to shout and I got cross and I threw the food across the room, which I know I shouldn't have done. You grabbed the chopping board and you threw it and it hit my foot and broke my toes. And afterwards at home, your father and I had a huge argument. And I couldn't walk properly for a month. Do you remember that? And your father had to look after you. And I remember looking at the two of you and seeing you together and thinking how you really, you were really different with him. Much calmer. And it made me so sad because it was like you didn't need me at all. And I think then I realized you and your father were probably better off if I wasn't living in the house. And Roger asked me if I wanted to come with him. And it broke my heart, but eventually I decided it would be better for all of us if I went. And so I said yes. And I meant to say goodbye. But when I rang, your father said he, he, father, he said I couldn't. He was really angry. He said I couldn't. He said I couldn't talk to you. And I didn't know what to do. He said I was being selfish and that I was never to set foot inside the house again. And so I haven't. I wonder if you can understand any of this. I know it will be difficult for you. I thought what I was doing was for the best of all of us. I hope it is. Christopher, I never meant to hurt you. I used to have dreams that everything would get better. Do you remember you used to say that you wanted to be an astronaut? Well, I used to have dreams where you were an astronaut and you were on television. And I thought, that's my son. I wonder what it is that you want to be now. Has it changed? Are you still doing maths? I hope you are. Loads and loads of love, mother. Christopher moves to the middle of the track. He crouches down. He rolls himself into a ball. He starts hitting his hands and his feet and his head against the floor as the letter continues. Christopher's thrashing has exhausted him. He has been sick. He lies still for a while, wrapped in a ball. Christopher? Christopher? Christopher does not respond. Christopher? Christopher, what the hell are you doing? What are you... These are... Oh, shit. Oh, Christ. Christopher doesn't move or respond. Ed stops himself from crying. It was an accident. Christopher does not respond. I don't know what to say. I was in such a mess. I said she was in hospital because I didn't know how to explain. It was so complicated. And once I said that, I couldn't change it. It just it got out of control. Christopher doesn't respond. After a time, Ed approaches him. Very, very gently, he touches his shoulder. Christopher doesn't respond. Oh, Jesus, Christopher, you got sick all over your... Let's sit you up and get your clothes off and get you into bed, okay? I'm going to have to touch you, but it's going to be all right. Ed lifts Christopher onto the side of the bed. Christopher doesn't resist or fight at all. Ed takes Christopher's jumper and shirt off. 30, home. Look, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I want you to know that you can trust me. Life is difficult, you know? It's bloody hard telling the truth all the time. But I want you to know that I'm trying. You have to know that I'm going to tell you the truth from now on about everything. Because if I don't tell you the truth now, then later on it hurts even more. So, 
I killed Wellington, Christopher. Just let me explain. When your mum left, Eileen, Mrs. Shears, she was very good to me. She helped me through a very difficult time, and I'm not sure I would have made it without her. Well, you know how she was around here most days, popping over to see if we were okay. If we needed anything, I thought, well, shit, Christopher, I'm trying to keep this simple. I thought we were friends, and I guess I felt wrong. We argued, Christopher, and she said some things I'm not going to say to you because they're not nice, but they hurt. But I think she cared more for that bloody dog than for us. And maybe that's not so stupid looking back. Maybe it's easier living on your own, looking after some stupid mutt, than sharing your life with actual other human beings. I mean, shit, buddy, we're not exactly low maintenance, are we? No. Anyway, uh, we had this fight. Well, quite a few fights, to be honest. Um, but after this particularly nasty little bust up, she chucked me out of the house. And you know what that bloody dog was like. Nice as pie one minute, roll over, tickle its stomach, sink its teeth into your leg the next. Anyway, we're yelling at each other and it's in the garden. And so when she slams the door behind me, the bugger's waiting for me. And I, I know, I know, maybe if I'd have just given it a kick, it probably would have backed off. But shit, Christopher, when the red mist comes down, Christ, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, we're not that different, me and you. It was like everything I'd just been bottling up for two years, just... I promise you, I never meant for it to turn out like this. Ed holds his right hand up for Christopher to touch. Christopher ignores it. Ed stares at Christopher. Okay. Look, Christopher, I'm sorry. Let's leave it for tonight, okay? I'm going to go downstairs and you get some sleep and we'll talk in the morning. It's going to be all right. Honestly. Trust me. Ed leaves. Christopher groans. He starts counting. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 10, 24, 20, 48, 40, 96, 81, 92, 16, 385, 32, 7, 68, 32, 7, 68, 32, 7, 68. That murdered Wellington. That meant he could murder me. I had to get out of the house. I made a decision. I did this by thinking of all the things I could do and deciding whether they were the right decision or not. Stay home. I decided I couldn't stay home anymore. Christopher, please. No, because I can't live in the house with you anymore because it's dangerous. I can't go live with you because you, you can't look after me when school's closed. I could try and- No, because you're a teacher. Yes. Not a family or a friend or a member of my family. You could go and live with your Uncle Terry. You live in Sunderland. I don't know how to get to Sunderland. Get a train. Get the train from Swindon. Also, you smoke cigarettes and you stroke my hair. You're not a friend either. I think I am a friend. No, and you're not a member of my family. I do have a dog. Yes, but I can't stay overnight in your house and use your toilet because you've used it and you're a stranger. I'm not really a stranger, Christopher. Yes. Four fifty one C Chapter Road, London. NW two five MG. Four fifty one C Chapter Road, London. NW two five MG. Four fifty one C Chapter Road, London. NW two five NG. Christopher looks at Judy. Four fifty one C Chapter Road, London, N W two five N G. Light falls. End of part one. Does anybody need to take a break real quick before we begin? Part two. Okay. I'm gonna take a I'm gonna slip down, but you guys can start because I don't come back in for a minute. So lit. I'm gonna go get my dessert dessert. Go get your dessert. Right? All right, I'll see you guys on the flip side. Flippy flip, cool. Um, if everybody else is ready, part two, 31 schoolroom and school hall. 
The company is on stage. Christopher, I want to ask you something. Mrs. Gascon wondered if we would like to do a play this year. She asked me to ask everybody if we'd like to make some kind of performance for the school. Everyone could join in and play a part in it. I think it would be a good thing for everybody to join in and play a part in it. I was wondering if you'd like to make a play out of your book. No. I think it could be really good fun, Christopher. I think it could be really good fun. No, it's a book and it's for me and not for everyone, just for me. I know that, Christopher, but I think a lot of people would be interested in what would happen if people took your book and started acting bits of it out. No, I don't like acting because it's pretending that something is real when it is not real at all. So it's just kind of like a lie. But people like stories, Christopher. Some people find things which are kind of true in things which are made up. You like your Sherlock Holmes stories, and you know Sherlock Holmes isn't a real person, don't you? I would help you if you were worried about that. No. I think I'd rather like to take the part of a policeman. You're too old to be a policeman. Christopher! Christopher! Company move into the space and watch Ed. Christopher hides. Nobody gives Ed a clue as to where Christopher is. After a while, he gives up. 32 Street. Then Christopher comes out. He's holding Toby in his cage. Christopher, what on earth happened to you? Can you look after Toby for me? No. He eats special pellets and you can buy them from a pet store. And he needs fresh water every day too. Why do you need somebody to look after Toby, Christopher? I'm going to live with mother. I thought you told me your mother was dead. I thought she was dead, but she's still alive. And father lied to me. And also, he killed Wellington. Is your mother here? No, mother is in London. So you're going to London on your own? I think I am going to do that, yes. Where's your father at the moment, Christopher? I don't know. Well, perhaps we should try and give him a ring and see if we can get in touch with him. I'm sure he's worried about you and I'm sure that there's been a, a dreadful misunderstanding. 33, home. Christopher leaves. He goes back to his house. He sees his dad's credit card on the floor. He stares at it, frozen in his tracks. He approaches the card. He takes it, puts it in his pocket. 3558. 3558. 3558. 3558. 3558. 3558. He leaves the house. 34, Swindon. The company makes Swindon town center. Where can I buy a map? I don't know. Where do you want to get to? I'm going to the train station. You don't need a map to get to the station. You can see it from here. No, I can't. There. It's that building. The signal point on the top. There's a British rail sign on the other end. The station's at the bottom of that. You mean that stripy building with the horizontal windows that you can see poking out over those houses? That's the one. How do I get to that building? Jeez Louise. I knew that the train station was somewhere near. And if there's somewhere is near, if there's something nearby that you can, ugh, and if something is nearby, you can find it by moving in a spiral, walking clockwise and taking every right turn until you come back to a road you've already walked on and then taking the next left and then taking every right turn and so on and so on. And that is how I found the train station. 35 Swindon train station. The voices here are pre-recorded. Customers seeking access to the car park, please use assistance phone opposite, right of the ticket office. Warning, CCTV in operation. Great Western. Colt Fears and Logans. Caution, wet floor. Your 50p will keep a premature baby alive for 1.8 seconds. Transforming travel. Refreshingly different. It's delicious, it's creamy, and it's only one pound thirty. Hot chalk to luck. Zero art eight seven art seven 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 six seven six. The lemon tree. No smoking. Fine teas. 
Automatic fire door, keep clear. Air conditioned. Reserve parking. Open as usual this way. No smoking. No alcohol. Dogs must be carried. RVP. Dogs must be carried. LFB. A perfect blend. Royal Mail. Monday to Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Dogs must be carried at all times. Special lunch offers. Parking subject to the Railway Bylaws, Section 219 of the Transport Act 2000. Please stand on the right. Superb coffee. Step free access. Take extra care with children. Superb coffee. Cash dispensers. Superb coffee. Dogs must be carried at all times. You all right, young man? You're too old. Are you all right, young man? You're too old to play a policeman. Are you all right, young man? No. Yeah, you're looking a bit worse for the wear. The lady at the cafe said that when she tried talking to you, you were in a complete trance. What's your name? Christopher Boone. Where'd you live? 36 Randolph Street. What are you doing here? I needed to sit down and be quiet and think. Okay, let's keep it simple. What are you doing at the railway station? I'm going to see Mother. Mother? Yes, Mother. When's your train? I don't know. She lives in London. I don't know when there's a train to London. So you don't live with your mother? No, but I'm going to. Mm. So where does your mother live? In London. Yes, but where in London? 451C, Chapter Road, London, NW2, 5NG. What is that? That's Toby, my pet rat. A pet rat? Yes, a pet rat. He's very clean and he hasn't got the bubonic plague. Well, that's very reassuring. <laughs> yes. Have you got a ticket? No. So how precisely were you going to get to London then? I have a bank card. Is this your card? No, it's father's. Father's? Yes, father's. Okay. He told me the number, it's 3558. Why don't you and I take a stroll to the cask machine, eh? You mustn't touch me. Why do I want to touch you? I don't know. Well, neither do I. Because I got a caution for hitting a policeman, but I didn't mean to hurt him, and if I do it again, I'll be a lot worse because of the caution. Please insert your card. You're serious, aren't you? Yes. Enter your personal identification number. You lead the way. Where? Back by the ticket office. Please enter amount. 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds. How much does it cost to get a ticket to London? Uh, about 20 quid. Please wait. Your transaction is being processed. Is that pounds? Christ alive, yep. It's 20 pounds. Please take your card and wait for your cash. Well, I guess I shouldn't keep you chatting any longer. Where do I get a ticket for the train from? You're a prize specimen, aren't you? Where do I get a ticket for the train from? In there. Now, are you sure you know what you're doing? Yes, I'm going to London to live with my mother. Has your mother got a telephone number? Yes. Can you tell me what it is? Yes, it is 02088878907. And you'll ring her if you get any tr into any trouble, okay? I want to go to London. Don't mind? I want to go to London. Single or return? What does single or return mean? Do you want to go one way or do you want to come back? I want to stay there when I get there. For how long? Until I go to university. Single then. That'll be 17 pounds. When is the train to London? Platform one, five minutes. Where's platform one? Through the underpass and up the stairs, you'll see the signs. Somebody bumps into Christopher. He barks at them like a dog. Underpass means tunnel, Christopher. In your head, imagine a big red line across the floor. It starts at your feet and goes through the tunnel. And walk along the line. And count the rhythm in your head because that helps, doesn't it? Like when you're doing music or you're doing drumming. Left, right, right. Left, right, left, right, 
left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Is this the train to London? 36 on train. Christopher, caught you just in time. We've got your father at the police station. He's looking for you. Christopher tries to run. The policeman grabs him. Christopher screams. The policeman lets go. Okay, let's not get overexcited here. I'm going to take you back to the police station and you and me and your dad can sit down and have a little chat about who's going where. Have you arrested father? Arrested him? What for? He killed a dog with a garden fork. The dog was called Wellington. Well, we can talk about that as well. Right now, young man, I think you've done enough adventuring for one day. The policeman reaches out to touch him. He screams. Now listen, you little monkey. You can either do what I say or I'm going to have to make... The train begins to move. Shit, fuck. Why are you swearing? Have we started? Has the train started? Don't move. Rob. Yeah, it's Nigel. I'm stuck here on the bloody train. Yeah, don't even. Look, it stops at, uh, Didcart Parkway. So if you can get someone to meet me with a car. Oh, cheers. Tell us old men we've got him, but it's going to take a while, okay? Great. Let's get ourselves a seat. Park yourself. You are a bloody anvil, you are. Jeez. 36A, dream. I see everything. Most other people are lazy. They never look at everything. They do what is called glancing, which is the same word for bumping off something and carrying on in almost the same direction. And the information in their head is really simple. For example, if they are on a train looking out of a window at the countryside, it might be one. I am sitting on a train looking out at a field that is full of grass. Two. There are some cows in the field. Three. It is sunny with a few clouds. Four. There are some flowers in the grass. Five. There's a village in the distance. Six. There is a fence at the edge of the field and it has a gate in it. And then they would stop noticing anything because they would be thinking about something else, like... I wonder if Julia's given birth yet. Or... I'm worried I might have left the oven on. Or... I really want a bag of cheese puffs. But if I am sitting and looking out of the window on a train into the countryside, I notice everything. Like... As Christopher talks, he wraps out a nervous rhythm with his hand. Uh, bold text indicates text actually spoken by Christopher as his language breaks down. One, there are 19 cows in the field, 15 of which are black and white and four of which are brown and white. Two, there is a village at the distance with 31 visible houses and a church with a square tower and a spire. Three, there is a, towel, a plastic bag from Tesco and the hedge and a squashed Coca-Cola can with a snail on it. Four, I can see three different types of grass and, three, and two colors of flowers in the grass. Five, the cows are mostly facing uphill. Six, there are three different visible nimbus stratus clouds. Seven, the hedge is moving to suggest that there's a wind blowing from the northwesterly directions. Eight, there's a white Reebok running shoe in one corner of the field. Two, nine, there's, not, there's Coca-Cola. Ten, there's a snail. The snail, there's, there are cows. The cows are facing the snail. Then there's Nimbus Stratus clouds. There's a wind. There's a hedge. There's a Boeing 747 for 100. There's a white Reebok trainer. There's graffiti. Jane plus Ian forever. 36B, back to reality. Oh, Christ, you wet yourself. For God's sake, go to the bloody toilet, will you? But I'm on a train. They do have toilets on trains, you know. Where is the toilet on the train? Through those doors there. But I'll keep an eye on you, you understand? No. Just go to the bloody toilet. Christopher stands. He walks down the corridor of the train. Shaking, closing his eyes, he pisses. He tries to wash his hands, but can't because there is no running water. He spits on his hands to wash them. He rubs them dry with toilet paper. Shaking, he leaves the toilet. He goes to the luggage rack. He climbs onto the shelf. He hides himself. He starts listing prime numbers to himself. As he continues to count, the policeman notices he's gone. The counting, continue, counting continues under the following exchanges. Two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, Christopher? nineteen, twenty-three. Christopher. Oh, Thirty-one, oh. thirty-seven, forty. He leaves. Christopher 40, stays 40, where he is, 40, still 40, counting. A woman approaches 50, him to take her bag. You scare the living daylights out of me. Can I just get my bag? I, I think someone's out there on the platform looking for you. I know. Well, it's your funeral. She takes her bag. She leaves. Christopher stays hidden behind a smaller pile of bags. Still counting, a posh woman approaches. Takes her bag. You're touching my bag! Yes. She leaves. Christopher stays hidden behind a still smaller pile of bags. Still counting, two drunk men approach. Takes their bags. 
<laughs> Come on, look at this, Barry. They've got like a terrain elf. <laughs> Well, we should kidnap him. Oh, uh, we could be our elf mascot. Come on, shit, you stupid dick. Haven't you got a gnome to go to? A lady takes her bag and it's the wrong one. She realizes. Bollocks. Another lady runs to grab her bag. She's talking to someone on the platform. Coming! I'm coming, all right. Wait for me in the car park, then. Both ladies take the correct bag and leave Christopher alone. He stops counting. He lies still for a while. He looks around. For the first time, he is alone on stage. I waited for nine more minutes, but nobody else came past, and the train was really quiet, and I didn't move again. So I realized the train had stopped moving, and I knew that the last stop on the train was London. I heard the sound of feet and it was a policeman and I could see him looking through the door next in the next carriage looking under the seats. I decided I didn't like policemen so much anymore. So I got off the train. Christopher very tentatively gets down off the luggage rack and off the train. 37 platform. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left. These voices are also recorded. Sweet pastries. Heathrow Airport, check in here. Bagel factory. Eat. Excellence and taste. Yo, sushi. Station link. Buses. W.H. Smith. Mezzanine. Heathrow Express. Clinique. First class lounge. Fuller's. Easycar.co. Come on. Um, the Mad Bishop. And Bear Public House. Fuller's London Pride. Dixon's. Our Price. Paddington Bear at Paddington Station. Ticket. Taxis. First aid. Eastburn Terrace. Way out. Page Street. The Lawn. Queue up here, please. Upper Crust. Stainsbury. Local information. Great Western First. Position. Closed. Closed. Position closed. Sock shop. Fast ticket point. Millie's cookies. Coffee. Fergie to stay at Manchester United. Freshly baked cookies and muffins. Cold drinks. Penalty fares. Warning. Savory pastries. Oh. Platform 14. Burger King. Fresh filled. The Reef Cafe Bar. Business travel. Special edition. Top 75 albums. Evening standard. As the chorus becomes more cacophonous, Christopher finds it more difficult to continue to walk. Christopher stops, rests his, heads, his head against a box, puts his hand over his ears. A station guard approaches him. You look lost. Christopher pulls out his Swiss army knife. The guard backs away. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Christopher carries on. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. He makes his hand into a telescope to limit his field of vision. He approaches an information center. Is this London? Is this London? Hmm, indeed it is. How do I get to 40... 40- 451C Chapter Road, London, NW2 5NG. Where is that? It's 451C Chapter Road, London, NW2 5NG. Also, sometimes you can write it as 451 Chapter Road, Wilsdon, London, NW2 5NG. Mm, Take the tube to Wilsdon Junction or Wilsdon Green. Got to be near there somewhere. What is a tube? Are you for real? (laughs) Over there. 
See that big staircase with these escalators? See the sign? It says, underground, take the Baker Blue Line to Wilston Junction, or the Jubilee to Wilston Green. Are you okay? Don't do this, Christopher. Get away from me. Christopher, you won't be able to. I'm doing really well. Where's your Swiss Army knife? Have you lost it? It's in my pocket. Where's your red line gone? See? It's disappeared, hasn't it? How the hell are you going to find the Jubilee line? You don't even know what an escalator is, do you? It's a moving staircase. You step onto it, it carries you down. Look, it's funny. Stop laughing. It's like something out of science fiction. I'm worried about you. You're lying. You killed Wellington. Where are you going? To watch the people. It's easy. Look, you go to the black machine. You look at where you want to go. You find the price. You put your money in. You haven't got any money. I have. I stole your card. You little shit. You take ticket and change. You go up to the grey gate. You put your ticket in the slot. It comes out the other side. There's no Jubilee line. How are you going to get to Williston Garden? There's a Bakerloo line. Look, I can take that to Wilson Junction. Come back home. Swindon's not my home anymore. It's 451C Chapter Road, London, NW2 5NG. 39 platform. The tube line appears. Stand behind the yellow line. I know. The train will be very noisy. I know. It'll really scare you. I know. Try not to let it. Watch what the people do. Watch how they get on and off. Yes. The company stand with Christopher on the platform. Count the trains. Figure it out. Get them rhythm right. Train coming. Train stopped. Doors open. Train going. Silence. Train coming. Train stopped. Doors open. Train going. Silence. Train coming. Train stopped. Doors open. Train going. Silence. Train coming, train stopped, doors open, train going, silence. Train coming, train stopped, doors open, train going, silence. Train coming, train stopped, doors open, train going, silence. Train coming, train stopped, doors open. <laughs> Christopher looks in Toby's cage. He can't find Toby. Toby? Toby, where are you? Toby, Toby, what are you doing down there? Toby, you get back up here this instant. I'm warning you. If you don't get back up here this instant, then I will come down there and get you. Right. I'm coming down there, Toby, and when I catch you, you're going to be I'm going to be very cross. I'm not going to let you play on your wheel for a whole week. Jesus, what are you doing? My rat is on here. Get out of there, for fuck's sake. Toby, it's filthy down here. You'll get so dirty. Oh, my days. What is he doing? What's the bloody one look like he's doing? Call somebody. Get somebody. Don't just stand there. There's nobody to call, mate. Please, for Christ's sake, just get, it back. just get back up here. I can't get back up there. My rat is on here. What? Mate, please, you're going to get yourself killed. You're going to have to go down there and get him. Me? What the hell is it going to do with me? He's a kid. You can't just let him get hit. Yes, I know he's a kid. I can see he's a kid by the bloody way looking at him. Mate, please, come on. Toby, stop being so difficult. This is, this is ridiculous, mate. Get your ass out of there now! His brain starts rumbling. Don't panic, I found him. Help him then, you muppet! Christ. Christopher and Toby are back on the platform. What the fuck do you think you were playing at? I was finding Toby. He's my pet rat. Fucking Lord. Is he okay? <laughs> Thanks a fucking button, him. Thanks a fucking bundle. Jesus Christ, a pet rat. Oh, shit, my train, fuck! Man with socks leaves. Are you okay? She touches his arm, he screams. Okay, okay, okay. Is there anything I can do to help you? Stand further away. I've got a Swiss Army knife and it has a saw blade and it could cut someone's finger off. <laughs> okay, buddy. I'm gonna take that as a no. Punk girl leaves. Christopher counts the trains again. Train coming, train stopped. Doors open, train going. Christopher groans. Trains coming, train stopped. Doors open, train going. Christopher groans. Train going, train stopped. Doors open. Christopher is bundled onto the train. 40, tube train. Is this train going to Wilson Junction? The voices here are recorded. There are 53,963 holiday cottages in Scandinavia and Germany. 
Is this train going to Wilsdon Junction? Three, four, three, five. Penalty, 25 pounds if you fail to show a valid ticket for your entire journey. Discover gold, then bronze. Is this train going to Wilsdon Junction? TVIC. Epic. Obstructing the doors can be dangerous. Con, I see. Is this train going to Wilston Junction? Talk to the world. Warwick Avenue, Maida Vale, Kilburn Park, Queen's Park, Kensal Green, Wilston Junction. 41 Wilston Junction. Where is 451C Chapter Road, London, NW2 5NG? A shopkeeper shows him an A to Z of London. A to Z of London, 595. Are you going to buy it or not? I don't know. Well, if you can keep your dirty fingers off it, you don't mind. Where is 5, 451 Chapter Road, London, NW2 5NG? You can either buy the A to Z or you can get out. I'm not a walking encyclopedia. Is that the A to Z? No, it's a bloody crocodile. Is that the A to Z? Yes, it's the A to Z. Can I buy it? Five ninety-five. but you're giving me the money first. Christopher examines the A to Z. He opens it. He looks for chapter road. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Christopher closes the map. His voice quite quiets the more he talks. And as he talks, he squats and then huddles into a ball. Christopher sits silently, huddled for a while. 42, outside Judy's house, Judy and Roger enter. I don't care whether you thought it was funny or not. Judy, look, I'm sorry, okay? Well, perhaps you should have thought about that before you made me look like a complete idiot. Christopher stands up. Judy sees him. The two look at one another. You weren't in, weren't... so I waited for you. Christopher. What? Christopher! What the hell is going on? I'm, I'm so sorry, Christopher. I forgot. Judy spreads her fingers. Christopher spreads his to touch hands with her. I suppose this means Ed's here. Where's your father, Christopher? I think he's in Swindon. <laughs> Thank God for that. But how did you get here? I came on the train. Oh my God, Christopher, I didn't, I didn't think I'd ever. Why are you here on your own? Christopher, you're soaking. Roger, don't just stand there. Are you going to come in or are you going to stand out here all night? I'm going to live with you because father killed Wellington with a garden fork. Jumping, Jack Christ. Roger, please. Come on, Christopher, let's go inside and get you dried off. Come on then, soldier. Let's get you warmed up. You'll catch your death out here. Christopher doesn't move. You follow Roger. Christopher does move. He gives Toby to Roger. He's hungry. Have you got any food I can give him and some water? 43, inside Judy's house. Are you okay, Christopher? I'm tired. I know, love. Can I get you a blanket? No, don't. I've got a sleeping bag in my backpack. Will you let me help you get your clothes off? I can get you a clean t-shirt. You could get yourself into bed. She leaves the bedroom and gets Roger to pass her a t-shirt. T-shirt. Pass me a t-shirt. She goes back into Christopher's room and changes him. He wears one of her old t-shirts. You're very brave. Yes. You never wrote to me. I know. Why didn't you write to me, Christopher? I wrote you all those letters. I kept thinking something dreadful had happened or you'd moved away and I'd never find out where you were. Father said you were dead. What? He said you went into hospital because you had something wrong with your heart and then you had a heart attack and died. Oh my God. Judy starts to howl. Why are you doing that? Oh, Christopher, I'm so sorry. What for? Bastard, the bastard. Christopher, let me hold your hand. Just, just for once, just for me, will you? I won't hold it hard. I don't like people holding my hand. No, okay. That's okay. 
44 in Christopher's bedroom at Judy's. I need to speak with him. He's been through enough today already. I know, but I still need to speak to him. Uh, Christopher Boone, can you please open the door? Come on, Christopher. Christopher, love, it's all right. Just open the door, will you, sweetheart? Is he going to take me away? No, Christopher, he isn't. Will you let him take me away? No, I won't. Your father says you've been away, is that right? Yes. Is this your mother? Yes. Why did you run away? Because father killed Wellington, who was a dog, and so that meant he could kill me. So I've been told. Do you want to go back to Swinton to your father, or do you want to stay here? I want to stay here. And how do you feel about that? I want to stay here. Hang on, I'm asking your mother. He told Christopher I was dead. Okay, let's... Talk into an argument about who said what here. I want to know whether... Of course he can stay. Well, I think that probably settles it as far as I'm concerned. Are you going to take me back to Swindon? No. If your, if your husband turns up and causes any trouble, just give us a ring. Otherwise, you're going to have to sort this, uh, this out amongst yourselves. 45, middle of the night, corridor outside of Christopher's bedroom. I'm talking to her whether you like it or not. Roger, don't. Just... I'm not going to sp be spoken to like that in my own house. I'll talk to you how I damn well like. You have no right to be here. He's my son, in case you've forgotten. What did you think you were playing at saying those things to him? You were the one that bloody left. So you just decided to just wipe me out of his life altogether? Now, let's just all calm down here, shall we? Well, isn't that what you wanted? I wrote to him every week. What the fuck use is writing to him? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I cooked his meals. I cleaned his clothes. I looked after him every weekend. I looked after him when he was ill. I took him to the doctor. I worried myself sick every time he wandered off somewhere at night. I went to school every time he got into a fight. And you, what? You wrote him some fucking letters. Chris Ray gets up out of the sleeping bag. So you thought it was okay to tell him his mother was dead? Now is not the time. Christopher finds his Swiss army knife. I'm going to see him, and if you try and stop me... Ed gets into Christopher's room. Christopher points his knife at him. Judy comes in. It's okay, Christopher. I won't let him do anything. You're all right. Christopher? Ed squats down, completely exhausted. Christopher still points the knife at him. Christopher, I'm really, really sorry about, about, about the letters. I never meant, I promise I will never do anything like that again. Ed spreads his fingers and tries to get Christopher to touch him. Christopher ignores him. He still holds his knife out. He groans. Shit. Christopher, please. Mr. Boone. What the fuck are you doing here? Did you call him? Mr. Boone, come on, mate. Don't fucking mate me. This is my son. I know. This can all be sorted out. Just come with me, please. I think you should go now. I think he's frightened. I'll be back. Christopher, I'll be back. I promise you, Christopher. I promise you, lad. Christopher groans. London policeman makes Ed leave. Roger watches them both leave. Judy and Christopher are left alone together. You go back to sleep now. Everything is going to be all right. They leave Christopher in his room. He lies down. He settles. 46, Judy's kitchen. Immediately, he has settled. It is the next morning. Judy, Roger and Judy give Christopher breakfast. He is overwhelmed by them. Okay. He can stay for a few days. He can stay as long as he needs to stay. This flat is hardly big enough for two people, let alone, let alone three. He can understand what you're saying, you know. What's he going to do? There's no school for him to go to. We both got jobs. It's bloody ridiculous. He gives him a strawberry milkshake. Roger, that's enough. You can stay as long as you want to stay. It was mother who gave me the milkshake. They look at him. 
It was mother who gave me the milkshake, not you. Judy picks the milkshake up. You need to shout more loudly at him. Like, you're really angry, not just being nice. Judy looks at him, nods. Okay. She puts the milkshake down. She's much angrier. Roger, that's enough. You can stay as long as you want to stay. She looks at Christopher, examining his response, expecting more feedback. I have to go back to Swindon. They both look at him. Christopher, you've only just got here. I have to go back because I have to sit my maths A-level. You're doing maths A-level? Yes, I'm taking it on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday next week. God. The Reverend Peters is going to be the supervisor. I mean, that's really good. I'm going to get an A-star, and that's why I have to go back to Swindon. And I, except I can't see Father, so I have to go back to Swindon with you. I don't know whether that's going to be possible. But I have to go. Let's talk about this some other time, okay? Okay. But I have to go back to Swindon. He stands and leaves. Christopher, please. 47 London Street at night. What time is it? Seven minutes past two in the morning. I can't sleep. It's because you're scared of Mr. She is. You're being silly. There's nobody about. You can hear traffic. Christopher wanders down the street. What cars are there? A Fiesta, a Nissan Micra, Micra, a Piogat, a Ford Granada. What colors are they? I can't tell. I can only see orange and black and mixtures of orange and black. Look at the things people have on their front gardens. Oh, yes. Is that an elf? It's a gnome and a teddy bear and a little pond, look. And an oven. I like looking up at the sky. Me too. When you look at the sky at night, you know they're looking at stars, which are hundreds of thousands of light years away from you. And some of the stars don't exist anymore because their light has taken so long to get to us that they are already dead. And they have, or they have exploded and collapsed into red dwarfs. And that makes you seem very small. And if you have difficult things in your life, it is nice to think that they are what is called negligible, which means that you, they are so small, you don't have to take them into account when you are calculating something. I can't see any stars here. No. It's because of all the light pollution in London. All the light from the street lights and the car headlights and the floodlights and the lights in the building reflect off tiny particles in the atmosphere and they get in the way of the light from the stars. Christopher! Judy starts looking for Christopher. I have to go. Don't. I have to. Siobhan? Siobhan, where are you going? Siobhan! Christopher! Christopher! Christopher stands up. Judy stares at him. Jesus Christ, what are you doing out here? I've been looking for you. I thought you'd gone. If you ever do that again, I swear to God. Christopher, I love you, but I don't know what I'll do. You need to promise me you won't leave the flat on your own again. Christopher, Christopher, do you promise me that? Yes. You can't trust people in London. 48, Judy's home. Don't be a bloody fool. I'm not being a bloody fool, Roger. They just, they got somebody in. They didn't even call me. They didn't ask me if I wanted to come back. I've been off two days. It's illegal, that is. It's a temporary job, for God's sake. I have to go to Swindon to take my A-level. Christopher, not now. I'm getting phone calls from your father threatening to take me to court. I'm getting so much grief from Raja. Roger, it is not a good time. But I have to go because it has been, it's been arranged and the Reverend Peters is, is going to invigilate, invigilate. It's only an exam. I can ring the school. We can get it postponed. You can take it some other time. I can't take it some other time. It's been arranged. And I've done, and it's, I've done lots of revision. And Mrs. Gascoigne said we could use a room at the school. Christopher, I am just about holding this together, but I am this close to losing it, all right? So just give me some. She breaks, she cries, she holds her fist to her mouth to try to stop herself. She leaves the room, she comes back. 49, Hampstead Heath. Would you like a nice lolly? Yes, I would, please. 
Would you like a strawberry one? Yes, I would please, because that's red. What's it called here? It's called Hampstead Heath. I love it. You can see all over London. Where are the planes going to? Heathrow, I think. Christopher, I rang Mrs. Gascoigne. I told her that you're going to take your maths A-level next year. Christopher screams. He throws his ice lolly away. Christopher, please calm down. Okay. Okay. Christopher, just calm down, love. Is he okay? Well, what does it look like to you? Christopher screams and screams. He only stops because his chest hurts and he runs out of breath. 50, Judy's home. Roger gives Christopher a radio and three children's books. You're muted, Stephanie Ann. Oh, Scheiser, sorry. It's Here okay. we are. You wanted a radio. 100 number puzzles. This is from the library. This one is called The Origin of the Universe. And <laughs> this one is Nuclear Power. They're for children. They're not very good. I'm not going to read them. Well, it's nice to know my contribution is appreciated. 51, Judy's Kitchen. Christopher, I made you a chart because you've got to eat, love. In here is some Compline. It's a powdered nutrition drink and it's got strawberry flavoring in it. Compline? Be quiet, Roger. Christopher, if you can drink 200 milliliters, then I'm going to put a bronze star on your chart. I don't believe this. Roger, for God's sake! If you drink 400 milliliters, a silver star. <laughs> and if you drink four, 600 milliliters, you get a gold star. A gold star. <laughs> well, that's very original, if I have a say. 52, Judy's home. Christopher picks up the radio. He leaves. He detunes it so that it is between two stations. He listens to the white noise. He turns up the volume very high. There's some time. Roger watches him. He opens and drinks four cans of lager. He necks the lager in one go. Roger comes into his room. He is very drunk. You think you're so clever, don't you? Don't you ever, ever think about other people for one second? Eh? <laughs> I bet you're really... Please with yourself now, aren't you? He grabs at Christopher. Christopher rolls himself into a ball to hide. Judy comes into the room. She grabs Roger. She pulls him away from Christopher. Christopher is moaning, still in his ball. Christopher, I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. I promise this will never happen again. He remains in his ball. He doesn't stop moaning. Judy and Roger leave. Eventually, he calms. 40, or 53, Judy's home. What time is it? It's four o'clock. What are you doing? I'm packing some clothes. Where's Mr. Shears? He's asleep. Come downstairs, bring Toby, get into the car. Into Mr. Shears' car? That's right. Are you stealing the car? I'm just borrowing it. Where are we going? We are going home. Do you mean home in Swindon? Yes. Is father going to be there? Please, Christopher, don't give me any hassle right now, okay? I don't want to be with Father. Just, just, it's going to be all right, Christopher, okay? It's going to be all right? Are we going back to Swindon so I can do my maths A-level? What? I'm meant to be doing my maths A-level tomorrow. We're going back to Swindon because if we stay in London any longer, someone was going to get hurt. I don't necessarily mean you. Now, I need you to be quiet for a while. How long do you need me to be, to be quiet for? Jesus. Half an hour, Christopher. I need you to be quiet for half an hour. 54, home. How the fuck did you get in here? This is my house too, in case you've forgotten. Oh, is your fancy man here as well? 
Christopher starts drumming on one of the boxes. He begins drumming on them. He drums and drums and drums and drums. Ed and Judy talk inaudibly under the drumming. Christopher, Christopher, he's gone. You don't need to panic. Where he's gone to? He's gone to stay at his friend's house for a while. Is he going to be arrested or go to prison? What for? For killing Wellington. I don't think so. I think he'll only get arrested if Mrs. Shears presses charges. What's that? It's when you tell the police to arrest somebody for little crimes. They only arrest people for little crimes if you ask them. Is killing Wellington a little crime? Yes, love, it is. In the next few weeks, we're going to try to get a place of our own to live in. Can I still take my A-level? You're not listening to me, are you, Christopher? I am listening to you. I told you. I rang your headmistress. I told her you were in London. I told her you'd do it next year. But I'm here now, so I can take it. I'm sorry, Christopher. I, I didn't know we'd be coming back. This isn't going to solve anything. 55 Street. You've got a fucking nerve. Where are we going? Swanning around here as though nothing ever happened. Ignore her, Christopher. So he's finally dumped you too now, has he? Where are we going? You had it coming. Don't try to pretend that you didn't because you fucking did. Where are we going? We're going to the school. 56 school. So you're Christopher's mother? That's right, and you are? I'm Siobhan. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, yes. Yes, it's nice to meet you too. Hello, Christopher. Hello. Are you okay? I'm tired. He's a bit upset. Because of the A-level, you said. He won't eat, he won't sleep. Yeah. I spoke to Miss Gascoigne after you left. Right. She still actually has your A-level papers in three sealed envelopes in her desk. I actually still have the A-level papers in my desk. Does that mean I can still do my A-level? I think so. We're going to ring the Reverend Peters to make sure he can still come this afternoon and be your supervisor. And Miss Gascoigne is going to call the examination board to say that you're going to take the exam after all. I thought I should tell you now. So you could think about it. So I could think about what? Is this what you want to do, Christopher? If you say you don't want to do it, no one is going to be angry with you. And it won't be wrong or illegal or stupid. It will just be what you want, and that's fine. I want to do it. Okay. How tired are you? Very. How's your brain when you think about maths? I don't think it works very well. What's the logarithmic formula for the approximate number of prime numbers not greater than X? I can't think. 57 exam room. Reverend Peters enters. He picks up one envelope. He opens it. He looks at it. He carefully places it face down on Christopher's table. He goes to sit opposite him. He takes out a stopwatch. So this is jolly exciting, eh, Christopher? Well, I'm excited anyway. Now, the exam is going to last for 90 minutes, Christopher, okay? First thing to do is put your name on the front. Okay, young man, are you ready to roll? Turn over the paper, please, Christopher, and begin. Christopher turns over the exam paper. He stares at it. He can't understand any questions. He panics. His breathing becomes <clears throat> erratic. To calm himself, he counts the cubes of cardinal numbers. 1, 8, 27, 64, 125, 216, 330, 343, 512, 729, 1, 000, 1331. Are you all right, Christopher? I can't read the question. What do you mean? I can't read the question. Can you see the question? I can see the question, but I can't read the questions because I look at them. They all seem confused and mixed up in the wrong way to me. Right. What does this question say? 
Christopher, I'm afraid I can't help you like that. I'm not allowed to. Christopher groans. <clears throat> Christopher, stop groaning. Get your breath. Count the cubes of the cardinal numbers again. 1, 8, 27, 64, 125, 216, 343, 512, 729, 1, 1331. Now, have another go. He looks at the questions again. Show that a triangle with sides that can be written in the form n squared plus 1, n squared minus 1, and 2n, where n is greater than 1, is right angled. You don't have to tell us. What? You don't have to tell us how you solved it. But it's my favorite question. Yes, but it's not very interesting. Well, I think it is. Christopher, people won't want to hear about the answer to a maths question in a play. Uh, look, why don't you tell it after the curtain call? When you finish, you can do a bow, and then people who want can go home, and if anybody wants to find out how you solve the maths question, then they can stay, and you can tell them at the end. Okay? Okay. He picks up his pencil. He starts answering. 58 home. Ed enters. Judy is behind him. Don't scream. Okay, Christopher, I'm not going to hurt you. Ed crouches down by Christopher. I wanted to ask you how the exam went. Tell him, Christopher. Please, Christopher. I don't know if I got all the answers questions right because I was very tired and I hadn't eaten any food, so I couldn't think properly. Ed nods. There is some time. Thank you. What for? Just... Thank you. I'm very proud of you, Christopher. Very proud. I'm sure you did really well. 59 school. How's your flat? It's not really a flat. It's a room. It's very small. The corridor is painted brown. Other people use the toilet. Mother has to clean the toilet before I can use it. Sometimes there are other people in there, so I do wet myself. The corridor smells like gravy and bleach. The room smells like socks and pine air freshener. And the other bad thing that happened is that Toby died because he was two years and seven months old, which is very old for a rat. I don't like waiting for my A-level result. If I was living at your house, I could have a room to put all my things and I wouldn't have to share the toilet with the strangers. Can I come live in your house so that I'll have a room to put all my things and I wouldn't have to share the toilet with strangers? No, Christopher, you can't. Why can't I? Is it because I'm too noisy and sometimes I'm difficult to control? No, it's because I'm not your mother, Christopher. No. That's very important, Christopher. Do you understand me? I, I don't know. Mother doesn't get back from work until 5.30, so I have to go to father's house between 3.49 and 5.30 because I'm not allowed to be on my own. Mother said I didn't have a choice. I push the bed up against the door in case father tries to come in the room. Sometimes he tries to talk to me through the door. I don't answer him. Sometimes he sits outside the door quietly for a long time. Ed enters, he's holding a kitchen timer. 60, home. Christopher, can I have a talk with you? Christopher turns away from Siobhan. No, 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 you can't, no. It's okay. I'll be here. I don't want to talk to father. Yeah, I'll do you a deal. Five minutes, okay? That's all. Ed sets the timer for five minutes. It starts ticking. Christopher, look, things can't go on like this. I don't know about you, but this, this just hurts too much. You being in the house but refusing to talk to me. You have to learn to trust me, and I don't care how long it takes. If it's a minute one day and two minutes the next and three minutes the next and it takes years, I don't care. Because this is important. This is more important than anything else. Let's call it, uh, let's call it a project. A project we have to do together. You have to spend more time with me. And I, I have to show you that you can trust me. And it will be difficult at first because, because it's a difficult project. But it will get better, I promise. You don't have to say anything. Not right now. You have to think about it. And I've got your present to show you that I really mean what I say and to say sorry. And because, well, 
You'll see what I mean. Ed leaves. He comes back with a big cardboard box. It is importantly cardboard and different to the other boxes. There's a blanket in it. He puts his hands in the box. He takes out a little sandy-colored golden retriever. He's two months old. Christopher, I would never, ever do anything to hurt you. The dog sits on Christopher's lap. You won't be able to take him away with you, I, I'm afraid. The flat's too small. But your father's going to look after him here. And you can come and take him out for walks whenever you want. Does he have a name? No. You can decide what to call him. Sandy. He's called Sandy. The alarm goes off. They look at each other. We need to go now. Yes. We'll come back tomorrow and you can see him then. 61 School. Christopher? Yes? Here. What's this? <clears throat> it's your result, Christopher. Right. You need to open it and read it. Right. He does. Well, what does it say? I got an A star. Oh. Oh, it's just... It's terrific, Christopher. Yes. <clears throat> Aren't you happy? Yes, it's the best result. I know it is. How's your dog? He's very well, thank you. I stayed last week at Father's because Mother got the flu and he slept on my bed so he can bark in case anyone came into the room at night. Right. How are you getting on with your father? He planted a vegetable patch in his garden. I helped him and Sandy watched. We planted carrots and peas and spinach, and I'm going to pick them all when they're ready. He brought me a book, which is called Further Maths for A-Level. He told Mrs. Gascon that he was going to, Gascon, that I was going to take further maths next year. She said, okay. Okay. I'm going to pass it and get an A-star. And then in two years, I'll take my A-level physics and get an A-star. And then I'm going to go to university in another town. I can take Sandy and my books and my computer. I can live in a flat with a garden and a proper toilet. And then I will take, I will get a first class honors degree and then I'll be a scientist. I can do these things. I hope so. I can, I can because I went to London on my own. She looks at him. I solved the mystery of who killed Wellington. She looks at him. I found my mother. I was brave. You were. And I wrote a book. I know. I read it. We turned it into a play. Yes. Does that mean I can do anything, you think? Does that mean I can do anything, Siobhan? Does that mean I can do anything? The two look at each other for a while, lights black. After the curtain call, Christopher returns to the stage. He gets the attention of anybody still in the audience, even if it is just one person. He thanks them for staying. Using as much theatricality as we can throw at it, using lights, music, lights, sound, lasers, the boxes, the train tracks, the rest of the company, the orchestra, the fucking ushers, for Christ's sakes, using dance, song, bells, whistles, the works, he proves by means of a counterexample about a triangle with sides that can be written in the form of n squared plus one, n squared minus one, and 2n, where n is greater than one, is right angled. Uh, maths appendix. After the applause, lights down, smoke, Christopher appears rising through the center trap. There's a very, there's very cool electro music. Thank you very much for clapping and thank you very much for staying behind to listen how I answered the question on my maths A level. Siobhan said it wouldn't be very interesting, but I said it was. She didn't tell me what I should use, so I decided to use all the machines and computers in the theater building. VL 3500 AR arc lights, which are moving lights. Lights, light emitting di diodes. Ooh. Meyer ML MSL 2 speakers, a DPA boom mic, a, a Sennheiser radio transmitter, four P2D20KS Panasonic overhead projectors, and our stage manager called Doran will operate these. I had 90 minutes to answer 19 questions, but I spent 14 minutes doing moaning and groaning, which meant I only had four minutes to answer this question. A timer is projected displaying 4.00.00. .00. Show that a triangle with sides that could be written in the form n squared plus one, n squared minus one, and two where two n, where n is bigger than one, is right angled. And this is what I wrote. Christopher runs and starts the timer. Start the clock. 
A right angle triangle is made using projection or lasers if you have the money or holograms if you are in the future. If a triangle is right angled, one of its triangles will be 90 degrees and will therefore follow Pythagoras theorem. Pythagoras said that a squared, a squared plus b, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. To put, to put it simply, if you draw squares outside the three sides of a tri right angled triangle and then add up the area of the two smaller squares, this will be the air equal to the area of the larger square. This is only true if the triangle is right angled. The A question, the A level question in algebraic formula is, is an algebraic, oh, oh my God. The A level question is an algebraic formula for making right angled triangles. Algebra is like a computer program that works for whatever numbers you put into it. N squared plus one is the biggest number in the equation, which makes it the hypotenuse, which is the longest side of the triangle. To find the area of a square, you must multiply the length by the width. So the area of this square is 2n times 2n, which, is, which equals 4n squared. The area of the square is n squared minus 1 times n squared minus 1, which equals n to the power of 4 minus n squared, 4 minus 2n squared plus 1. Now, if we add these two squares together, this equals n to the power of 4 plus 2n squared plus 1. Now, we need to find the area of the square on the hypotenuse, which is n squared n squared plus 1 times n squared plus 1, which equals n to the power of 4, four plus 2n squared plus 1, which is the same term. So the area of two small squares adds up to the area of the larger square. So all of my squares fit together to satisfy Pythagoras theorem. So this triangle is right angled. And that is how I got an A star. Confetti. Christopher exits. <laughs> And the crowd roars. Do you have a sound effect ready? <laughs> that was I love it. That was a beautiful thing. <laughs> nice. Confetti. <laughs> Great job, everybody. Great job, everyone. Oh, great. Um, cool. Well, as with always, I'd like to promote a charity uh, this week doing uh autism dash society dot org um they're working uh they're uh let me find a quick sort of summary about them uh one way I found them was just like they're helping people with autism uh find dentists find social workers uh things that like just any person really needs in this world um but I think that obviously um if you are if you do not uh have autism things are i think a little bit easier for you uh and, and the world is a little more uh, uh cultivated and, and uh uh influenced to help you out as opposed to anybody that has autism um so this is i think it's a great sort of charity because uh it's treating this as sort of the thing that it is which is just another way that people exist um but yeah uh go donate to them um also in terms of things that i have to say after a show is done uh besides great job everybody uh please come to our discussion on monday um oh god do i have this pulled up correctly and then we're also deciding the show for next week tonight because we're trying out something new uh which is giving you all more time to decide if you would like to be a part of the shows that we read uh for the upcoming week um we're very grateful that you all have let's joined be us. real we're giving us more time <laughs> yeah, that's that's what it we, is. we we are giving us more time but i do think you know there's people that have responded on wednesday or tuesday when we're deciding sort of casting and we're sort of like creating space for them to read uh we've definitely like offered people to read stage directions so it, it works in both directions of like making sure that you guys uh it, personally if i was like not a part of the collective and somebody was like hey do you want to be a part of the show you have to decide by tomorrow that's like a lot of time stress that you have to worry yeah. about um so i mean overall this whole thing is for you all uh us as people that are organizing it super important for us to have more time so we can like find people who want to read uh but yeah um i'm really annoyed because telling people to vote i think worked against my uh trying to rig democracy <laughs> <laughs> yeah it does seem i do have it up it does seem eurydice by sarah rule is uh 
the winner. Um, I don't have Eurydice pulled up. I don't know the exact character count. Uh, if anybody seven. here has, it's seven. So you said Tom? Seven characters. Seven characters. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we can, you know, uh, if, if. And one reigning elevator. A reigning elevator? Mm -hmm. That it's sounds expensive. terribly destructive. Um, but yeah, if anybody here uh, is interested in reading uh, next week, just let us know. Um, you can let us know right now, or you can let us know um, in the future uh, within, you know, before next Thursday or before next, mm. I'd say Tuesday, you know, to give us all leeway uh, in terms of finding roles. Um, everybody, Alyssa, Stephanie, Ann, who reading for the first time this week, you are super invited. Not sure if you are all on Facebook, if you're uh, able to do that. We're representing the 505 today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 505. What does that mean? <laughs> Alp, New Mexico. Oh, sure. Yeah, I knew that. That's Sorry. where Breaking Sorry, Glass is filmed, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so there's a green, green chili. Some... We've got three Wait. states worth of uh, readers yeah. on tonight. Three states. Ooh. Guys, this is nice. amazing. I'm sorry, folks, this is amazing. That is pretty cool. Um, Hell yeah. Let's but, keep it going. Next goal. Tell your international friends. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, just let us know if you're interested. Um, yeah. Come to the discussion on Monday. Uh, Andy really does. He asks a lot of great questions. Our last discussion, which was about a show that pretty intense the goat or who is Sylvia it's like yeah. I think the most engaging conversation um yeah I'm sorry we didn't record it yeah we, we might have to start because that last one's so good yeah we have starting is great also like I think recording it is you know it, it's good because it doesn't give people this like feeling of like oh I'm going to be recorded with these like sort of intellectual right. thoughts I'm having uh you're, you're I won't to... tell you I'm recording that that's true. I, it doesn't oh, say Zoom does, Andy. Left hand corner of <laughs> this. Zoom. Uh, but yeah, please please come because Andy consent. Yeah, consent is super important, especially because Zoom yes, is recording all of right. anyway. They're <laughs> giving it to our fucking overlords anyway. Uh, that's true. Right. Thank you, Zoom overlords. Yeah, thank you, Zoom <laughs> overlords. Uh, we're glad that you like us reading these shows because we're not talking about. Uh, the real issues, which is that Black Lives Matter. Um, yes. Definitely us, not talking about that. Just got us demonetized in the Zoom world. Um, oh, shit. But Worth it. Yeah, come to the discussion on Monday. It's, it's always super great. You get to see the four of us miscreants again, as well as maybe anybody else who joins, and you're all terrific, wonderful people who are uh, just Please. a delight to see uh, on any day of the week. Um, we also, for those of you who just joined us or those of you who have been joining, in case you don't know, we do post the, the videos of these recorded readings on YouTube so that you can watch and review um, and feel really prepared to come talk about the play. And discussions involve no critique of, of no. any sort of like acting or performance choices whatsoever. They're no. literary discussions, so yeah, there's no pressure for on that end. Except for my ability to yeah. stay, uh, you know, with the same accent with this one character. That I, I think David gets the gold star for spot on accent. I don't, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty impressive. It's okay. That's enough of that. I'm offended. <laughs> he's he's, I he's blushing, y'all. <laughs> no, I, mean, it yeah. I actually like looked up and I'm like, what? It was good. Uh, everyone was delightful it was an absolute pleasure to have every single one of you here yeah especially tom who's not here to say thank you right now I'm <laughs> um, I found yeah, I mean, it. Does, does anybody have anything else they want to say i'm gonna press stop recording here shortly but i don't want to cut anybody off before they have anything important they want to say just as always, please, please come to the discussion or, if, uh, you know, invite people who might know this play to the, the, the discussion. 
Um, it's one of the, my favorite parts of every week when we do this. I just want everyone to be there and for, to have a great <laughs> conversation. So the no need to participate. We started if you the, don't want to. the live readings to supplement the discussions, but nobody wants to come talk about plays with us. They just want to read them. <laughs> And that's okay. Yeah. If anyone who wasn't in a live reading like. is welcome to come talk about them. <laughs> yes. It was super fun the one time I remembered it was Monday. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me on Mondays. I know when Thursday is, obviously. I know when Friday is. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going, damn it! Like like three times. <laughs> I think I've come once. Do you no, work like the nine to five? Like you just have to jump back into work mode on Mondays? There you go. Well, I that no, because I teach. So give me two. So the timing of you guys having to go back to work works out well because I have to go back to work about that time too. So, and yeah. I'm we'll, we'll figure out a way to persevere and make sure that yeah. this thing happens. Uh, Stephanie Ann had terrific uh, jokes this week, so you know yeah. they, they can uh, introduce the shows you know in, in, in my <laughs> uh because no it's not like my jokes land at all thank you everybody for laughing uh <laughs> so but, my service industry experience i'm really good at bad jokes <laughs> yeah i left the service industry stat when i was in it um fucking truth um don't you like kind of still kind of not Maybe that's not important yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Discussion for another day. Fuck, fuck my life. Um, which is what you my work for as well. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, okay. I'm gonna press stop recording. Um, nobody okay. else. Anything else they want to say? Okay, I'm pressing stop recording. Recording quick discussion.